finance in this particular moment. How much mathematics is needed in the world of finance today? I'm chilling to someone who studied mathematics but applies, but is an expert in global financial markets. Uh, David Taylor, uh, you have de your degrees in mathematical physics, but you are an expert in global financial markets. How is this possible? Well, firstly, I'd like to be careful about signing myself as a, an expert in global financial markets. Mm -hmm. I think being an expert in global financial markets really requires that you interact with them on a daily basis. And as a mathematician in the university, um, I'm not sure that's completely true. Oh. But um, to make the transition from physics into the world of finance yes. uh, was a bit of a long and convoluted story, and I don't think we really have time for that. Okay. But what happens when you study physics is that you gain a large number of skills, both modeling skills and mathematical skills. Okay. And because of the complexity of physics, it trains you to be able to take mathematical ideas, mathematical theorems, mathematical modeling skills, and apply them in just about uh, any circumstance. So you'll find physicists who have worked in physics for a while and then moved out of physics in a wide range of areas. You'll find them in finance, you'll find them in biology, you'll find them in engineering. So do they find physics boring or when you move from physics to <laughs> <laughs> you find physics boring? Look, I think the world has changed. Yes. So in the last 50 years, um, the dominance of physics is a sort of discipline of excellence, okay. and particularly a discipline that's heavily funded because of the change in the political structure of the world so the end of the Cold War and an enormous impact mm. on the funding of physics. Mm. So the entire Cold War, because of the applications of physics, particularly in, in uh, defense, uh, there was a lot of money going to, uh, into physics. So there were a lot of physicists employed. And not all of them were doing defense work or you know, nuclear yeah. uh, technology. But the, the spillover of money meant that there were a lot of physicists that were employed. But as the Cold War came to the end, could to an end yeah. in the 80s and early 90s, um, very clever physicists found themselves out of jobs. Okay. So they started to look for other areas to work in. Okay. And this was a gradual process over about 15 years. But you don't find it difficult to align um, physics and finance? Um, to... Well, I don't think I'm really doing physics in finance. I think that's part of the, the current global crisis, mm -hmm. is that a lot of people came into finance with a physics background or a mathematics mm -hmm. background. And in, in those disciplines, a lot of the work that you do is done with the physical world. And the physical world, to all intents and purposes, appears to have a set of, of, of rules. Right? So a lot of people say they're God's rules. Right? And our, our purpose in studying this stuff, experimenting, modeling, is to uncover those rules. So a lot of people with that mindset came into finance and um, try to apply the same techniques, the same ideas, that you're uncovering a hidden rule. And that hidden rule has a sort of um, constancy about it. In other words, once you find the rule, the rule will always be the same. Mm -hmm. And what's happened recently is that we're, we're realizing that there are no rules in finance because the rules are governed by people's behavior. Mm -hmm. And people's behavior is, it doesn't follow a set of predictable patterns, mm -hmm. by and large. Mm -hmm. So the techniques of physics are very good at, at unearthing connections between things and for modeling skills, mm -hmm. but sometimes those models break down. Mm -hmm. And physicists are particularly unprepared for their models to break down dramatically okay. in circumstances that don't really make sense to them. Mm -hmm. Well, mathematics, physics, mathematics, mathematics of finance, which you call it in the um, it sounds as if the mathematics precept is taking a career. That's this is the only way I like the importance of mathematics and the application of mathematics in your life. Mm -hmm. In my life? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I came to university in, in the early 80s as a, mm -hmm. as a young man and, and with a talent for mathematics. And over a number of years, I had the privilege of being able to try different things. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's one of the wonderful things about a university career and a university environment, is that it allows you to experiment, or it allowed me to experiment. So I didn't come to university with a specific idea of a career that I was going to have. In fact, the vague idea that I had when I arrived here was that I would do a three-year degree and then go and travel the world or something like that. But what happened is that as I, uh, as I discovered 
various aspects of mathematics, from pure mathematics through applied mathematics, computer science, statistics, and into physics, is that I got an opportunity to, um, to practice my skills in the various areas, to see if I had any skill in the various areas, and then to begin to realize those things which drew me, which attracted me. And that's how I ended up in mathematical physics. Um, and that lasted for quite a long time. And then <clears throat> at the end of my PhD, the group that I was working with at the university essentially dissolved. A lot of the key people left the university. And I was left at a moment in my career where I really had to make decisions about what I was going to do with myself um, with very little support. So by a variety, for a variety of reasons, I became involved in a very small mathematical finance program that had started here. It was just me and another guy. Yes. And we started to talk, and I started to read a lot of mathematical finance literature. Mm -hmm. So basically, I self-taught myself. Okay. No, I... And then very rapidly, I had to teach it. Yes. And there's nothing that teaches you about a topic better than having to teach it to other people, because yeah. you really have to go into it. OK, take us through uh, any case study. And the only case or case that uh, shows the application of my work in finance to um, Well, there's, I mean, there's a marvelous array of case studies. Um, <clears throat> I think what's important is to contextualize it. Mm -hmm. the, the financial world has changed dramatically over the last 30 or 35 years. Mm -hmm. And what has changed the financial world is that an age old system of, of primary securities, mm -hmm. primary securities being things of value which are, in some sense, tangible. So a commodity like gold, which you can physically hold in your hand. A share, which in the old days they used to issue a certificate and give you a certificate so you could hold it. These, these are primary securities. So over the last 30 years, really the birth of mathematical finance came from a piece of mathematical work that was done in the late 60s and early 70s, where securities have been created which everybody knows as derivative securities, where the value of the security is dependent on the value of something else. In other words, it has no intrinsic value itself. And what it really is, is an insurance policy, by and large. So most of them are designed to be insurance policies. So that has no tangibility at all. It's a promise between two people about a possible cash flow, a possible payment in the event of something like that. But unfortunately, what's happened is that the derivatives have come to dominate the market. In other words, the derivative market is very much larger than the primary market. Mm -hmm. So you have these intangible securities or assets mm -hmm. which have no realizable value except in the space of promise between two counterparties. Mm -hmm. And the mathematics that, that governs that is a similar mathematics for almost all of these securities. So the case studies are individual securities, however they're um, derivative securities, however they're created, yeah. however they're very imaginative people and they're very exotic things. Mm -hmm. um, the largest uh, volume of these things are quite simple products, mm -hmm. um, like most insurance policies, by the simple agreement. Mm -hmm. But they become more and more and more exotic, they become more and more and more of them. Mm -hmm. And the value, the apparent value of them has become larger and larger. Mm -hmm. So. The mathematics that you teach within the program, and the mathematics that I've had to learn over the last 15 years, is designed to create a modeling framework for almost all of these so-called derivatives, these insurance products. Yes. And each one of them, you use a very similar technique, which allows you to describe its value in terms of its reference, yes. whatever asset that it's re referring to. Yes. So you would come up with a model for the reference asset, and there's a standard set of models that we use. And then depending on the model that we've used for the underlying asset, it will inform us what sort of behavior to expect from the derivative security. And then we create a mathematical link between the two uh, through a fairly standard set of techniques, some stochastic calculus, some partial differential equations, if we can reduce it, and then some very computational work hopefully to solve the partial differential. Okay, are you talking about insurance? Are you talking about insurance companies? Do you also work with financial institutions? And I don't want to call you an expert in finance because I don't Should I call you a mathematician? But uh, the question is, uh, do you also work with financial institutions? 
in any sort of projects if I did. Yeah, I think let's get clarity on that. I mean, uh, these things being insurance products doesn't mean that insurance companies sell them. Uh, the vast majority of derivatives are insurance products sold between financial institutions. And the primary financial institutions for them are investment banks and merchant banks. So those are the people that I deal with primarily. And most of the graduates of this program, most of our graduates of the math finance programs around the world, end up working in investment banks or in an investment banking role. So they might work in the treasury of a very large, large corporate, but they would be working in a type of investment banking role. But their clients, because they sell derivatives primarily, the primary use of the derivatives is a, a type of insurance product, their clients would be pension funds, insurance companies, investment companies, that's the asset management companies. So the vast majority of, of uh, financial institutions that I do deal with are investment banks. Okay. Yeah, that's where we, we have our primary focus. Okay, what kind of careers are available for 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 in the global financial market and careers that are available for people studying mathematics? I mean I hear you talking about students the global financial market, but I need to it goes through some careers that are available. Okay, let me just let me just explain the, the model that we use mm -hmm. here. And it's a model that's used worldwide. Mm -hmm. Is that the the training that we do in financial engineering or mathematics or finance, they're used interchangeably around the world is that we take, we usually take students who have an undergraduate degree or in the case of engineers a four year degree so they, they finish their primary degree and we require people who have a high level of technical mathematical skill but we don't want people who have specialized so we take into the program people who have followed their interest in mathema pure mathematics, applied mathematics, computational mathematics computer science, engineering, and statistics and actuarial science. And we take people both from Bits University and from any university in South Africa. But they must have an undergraduate degree and a very good undergraduate degree with some obvious skill. Uh, do you think there's any mathematical solution uh, to, to, to the global financial world? Well, I think this is an illusion that's, that's being perpetuated, particularly by having physicists involved in the world. <laughs> is that it's that somehow mathematics produces a solution. Mathematics is a language. Oh. So it's a little bit like saying, is there a French solution to it, or a German solution <laughs> in a language? Yeah. So, no, I don't think mathematics is going to provide a solution. But what it is going to do mm. is that with a, with a lot of people looking at something which has such important consequences, people with talent using this language will come up with new ways of expressing it, new ways of understanding it, more complex ways of understanding it. I mean, a large part of, of what dropped us into this recession through the derivatives community was the use of relatively simple models, not relatively complicated models. Mm. So the models that we used were too simple, not too complicated. So that's, that's an so irony. So you think we should have used more complicated models? Well, that's part of the problem. They should have used more complicated models, but there are many other behavioral human aspects to this. So the modeling, particularly in the financial environment, is really one small stone in a very large wall. Mm -hmm. And the large wall is, is, is comprised of behavior. It's comprised of society. It's comprised of our understanding of money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you just briefly uh, explain a little bit how you can last with the mathematics of this language that's, you know, someone can learn or someone can you know, express it on space? Sure. I, yeah. I think it's a difficult thing because Skill in mathematics has obviously become very important uh, in a modern technologically driven world to be successful in that world. In other words, if you want to get ahead, make money, be successful, some level of ability in mathematics is needed. So certainly over the last 30 or 40 years, people with mathematical skills started to come to the fore because of those skills. Um, but in terms of what mathematics actually is when you apply it, not in its purest form, but when you apply it to, to, uh, to physical problems or biological problems or financial problems and uh, chemical problems, mm -hmm. is, it, is, it seems to be the natural way of describing something. So whenever you do modeling or whenever you're trying to understand something, the first step that you take is to find the natural way of doing it or the most natural way of doing it. And because of the 
the numerical component of finance. It's about numbers, right? It's in big numbers and small number. Can we measure it? What do we do with the measurement once we have it? Because effectively, it's all about numbers. Mathematics is the natural space in which to do this. And as a language, it has a set of rules, like the language that we're using between us, right? It has a verb, it has a subject, it has an object. So mathematics has a similar structure in that it creates a, a, a framework of logic that is transferable. So I don't have to sit with you. I can, I can write something down, I can build a model, I can send it to you, and you, because you speak the same language as me, in the mathematics, and, the rules. and you know the rules, can read what I've written. I could be dead a mm. hundred years, mm. and you can read what I've written, yes, and you can understand it. Yeah. So it's the same as writing a story or a poem or something. Okay. Yeah. Although, it has, it has a high level of precision. Mm. So over many, many centuries, it's been uh, honed to precision. What do you mean exactly when you say this means that means that? Mm. And because of that precision, it makes it very powerful. Mm. But similarly, because of the precision, it also means that it doesn't apply to everything. Mm. It doesn't always apply to human behavior. Mm. Right? Mm. And, and, and a part of the problem that we're facing at the moment is that we have this tool, and we think that it applies everywhere. So we're applying it to everyone. <laughs> and sometimes it just doesn't work. Or yeah. well, sometimes it requires uh, a new an augmentation of the tools, new tools, mm -hmm. bigger tools, better tools, more precise tools. Mm -hmm. And really that's the, 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 the industry of mathematics and finance, mm -hmm. is to start developing these tools. As we make mistakes, some of them catastrophic mistakes, mm -hmm. we realize we've been naive, we've used the wrong method.